Let's go straight to that boxing story then. We are joined by Ronan Mullen this morning. How are you getting on, Ronan? All's well, Owen. How are you? All good. Will we just dip straight into that question that Jer posed there about the heavyweights and what Saturday night does, what, uh, how we're looking in that division for the next little while? Yeah, well, it's spot on that the, the top three heavyweights sort of have a clear path. The top three that I think most people would land on would be Fury, Joshua and Wilder. But I think before Saturday, there was a very strong case that Dillian White had almost usurped Wilder in that number three position, just given the resume he's put together since he fought Joshua coming on five years ago. But now that has cleared up. But it does speak to the depth of the heavyweight division, something that's been absent probably since the turn of the century, where not only have we got that nice podium of really top champions, we've also got this brilliant tier of challengers coming through. And there's another one below, young up-and-comers, probably most notably Daniel Dubois, one of Frank Warren's charges, who's already blistering through the, the up-and-coming ranks. So the next couple of years promise to be incredible. And for the first time possibly ever, Britain seems to be the, the centre point for the heavyweight division. And as you touched on there a couple of minutes ago, it seems like the, the path has been cleared for that Joshua Fury fight. Should they overcome their next two fights? Furies would seem trickier on paper, obviously, against Wilder, who's just got that concussive knockout power of his own in the right hand. And then Joshua has Kubrat Pulev, who's a pretty decent operator, but at this point of his career, you'd think Joshua um, should get the job done. The only thing you would, the caveat you'd put there is Joshua hasn't fought in a long time. You know, he, he rematched Andy Ruiz in December of last year, and it will be December of this year before he gets back in the ring. So ring rust notwithstanding, I think those two should get the job done. And then possibly next summer, it'll be Joshua against um, Fury. That's a long way away still, notwithstanding the fact that um, we don't know what's going to happen behind closed doors if these fights can actually mm. happen. Is, is, is the, are the next two fights definitely going to happen this year, irrespective of, of whether or not there are crowds allowed? Or, or what's, what is the situation with that? Yeah, so Joshua and Pilev was supposed to happen a few weeks ago at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. And as you said, the absence of crowds kind of put the knockers on that. And I think most fighters have come around to the idea of fight, fight, or fighting behind closed doors. Joshua, given the huge gate receipts he draws in, was understandably less forthcoming in that regard and probably was trying to delay the decision as much as he could. But by December, I think, obviously, Matchroom had the test event at the Crucible for the snooker, and it's obviously a very different case. But I think Eddie Hearn is going to pitch to the government, basically, to let boxing be the next sort of test event. And um, There might be a crowd of some sort by December for that Joshua Pilev fight. But I think that will get done in December. The, the Fury Wilder one is, is interesting because ever since Wilder came out with that nonsense uh, excuse about his heavy costume weighing him down in the rematch, he's been very quiet. And there's been no real pointers to when he's going to you know, get back into action. The pandemic has obviously put that fight back a little bit too. But while we know Joshua and Pulev are getting it on December, there's still no firm date on, on the third fight between Wilder and Fury. Okay, let's let's talk a little bit about Katie Taylor. Um, I think a lot of people watching the fight were listening to the various commentators suggesting that Delphine Persoon was ahead, certainly going into the last two rounds. Um, you know, I, I don't know if Matthew Macklin actually said that he had it that score, but whoever the, the other person that they went to on the commentary definitely had Persoon up by two rounds heading into the final two rounds. And that's where people's surprise about the, certainly one of the judges scored the, the fight very one-sided for Katie Taylor. Andy Lee's card had her winning by... Two rounds, I think. Um, so I think that might be for people who are who are watching fights very sporadically, which mm. is generally most people. Why uh, the aggression of Pursuun was the thing that um, they're going to remember a lot from this fight. You thought Katie Taylor won the fight well. Yeah, I thought if if, that, if there was going to be a clear winner, it was Katie Taylor. Your point is fair that you know a two round win for Katie Taylor that's six four, and it only takes one of those rounds to be subjectively scored in the opposite direction to make it a 5-5 draw. So it, it was that kind of fight. I thought Katie edged it out. But, um, you know, it was close and competitive. And the nature of women's boxing, the two-minute rounds, make for great entertainment, but it makes the rounds incredibly hard to judge because they're so frenetic and high-tempo that often in over 12 three-minute rounds, there will be lulls. Of it's, it's quite clear. You can pick the quality work and rounds are quite easy to score. In that one, the judges had to, to earn their money because they were trying to spot the clean work amidst these incredible volleys from both fighters. I know Pursuin was throwing a lot, but Katie was uh, returning rallies in, in return herself. So 
um, to try and spot the actual landing clean shots was was a tough errand for the for the lads at ringside. I thought they did a reasonably good job. Generally, the 98-93 was, was a bit over the top, but if you land on the correct winner, there's been so many cards where the correct winner didn't get their hand raised that I, I don't really mind when, as long as they land on the, on the correct victor, yeah. I'm happy enough. Okay. Well, one thing I did want to ask as well, is like, so Katie Taylor has a welt on her forehead from the middle of the fight. You don't get that from a punch. You get that from a headbutt. And yeah. also, it's sore. So there's a, a strong chance that the, the middle few rounds might have been a direct result from something that didn't happen legally. And that's the other part of this where you're like, okay, well, you know, justice would have been, it would have been completely unjust if she'd taken a headbutt, which I suspect that was, because it, it definitely wasn't a punch, then, no. and then lost that, that fight afterwards. Yeah, and she absolutely flew out of the traps. It's kind of a calling card of her professional career. She always starts fast. She's actually scored a few early knockdowns in her career. And the way it was going in the first couple of rounds, Pursuing face, walking back to her corner after round two, it looked like she might not be long for this one, but it's just she had obviously a really poor preparation for Olympic qualifier at the start of the year. She took this fight at seven weeks' notice, which is relatively short notice given that Katie had been pegged to fight Amanda Serrano, a similar caliber of opponent, and had been preparing basically since January. So um, Pursuing like, kind of belied the notion that she wouldn't go to 10 rounds. She was as high tempo in round 10 as she had been in those middle rounds where she kind of came on strong. But it's a fair point about Katie, that welt in her forehead was definitely from a head clash. And if she looked in any way disorientated, maybe in those couple of middle rounds, that was probably why. But unlike in Madison Square Garden, I thought she was the one who closed the show stronger. She was the one who picked the landing shots. And in that last 20 seconds, grandstand finish, which I'm sure will be used in Sky promo reels for years and decades to come where the two of them are just swinging for the fences in those last 10 seconds. Like she stood there and held her ground against a presumably or a, an allegedly stronger opponent and, uh, and held her own. I thought it was a, a pretty spectacular fight for Katie Taylor and uh, another hallmark one on her career. Yeah, and that is the, the issue here, really. It's about making her be attractive in those fights enough to be able to sell in the States where the super money comes from. Talk of a crossover fight against some of the UFC stars as well. So if you were plotting the next 12 months, and I don't know how long Katie Taylor is going to continue to box because like, she's 34 and she's made a lot of money and she's done literally everything that's possible for her to do. So um, if you were plotting the next 12 months, what, what conversations is Brian Peters having with her about what's next? I, I do think this, the sky's the limit here. You mentioned she's 34, turned pro at 30, and she was world champion within 12 months. But when she fought Jessica McCaskill at the end of 2017, just over a year into her pro career, she did still seem like an elite amateur trying to parlay her skills into the professional game. And Jessica McCaskill threw the kitchen sink at her. And that win looks incredible in retrospect, given what McCaskill has gone on to do. But I, I think in the most recent phase of Katie's career, in the last 18 months or so, she's really established herself as a pro fighter. She's she's noticeably sitting down in her shots. She's flatter on her feet. She wasn't just bouncing in and out the other night. She was she boxed at all angles. She boxed at all distances. And I think she's set up to... Like, she's already conquered the lightweight division, which would be enough for most people. She's won a title at uh, the division above light welterweight, which, may, which sets her with Carl Frampton and Steve Collins as our only... Uh, two division world champions. So her, the next port of call will likely be to try and make history again and be the first three-weight world champion. She's in a race with Carl Frampton for that because Carl is fighting Jamel Herring uh, to become a three-weight champion himself. So those two will be trying to race to the finish line to see who can make that piece of history. But that again would lead to Katie fighting McCaskill, who somewhat incredibly, like a full-time accountant slash banker in Chicago, has uh, segued into this remarkable professional boxing career where having boxed Katie Taylor, she went on and won two titles at super lightweight, beat Cecilia Brykhouse, who'd be considered one of the pound for pound greats of women's boxing last weekend, and oh. now holds all the, all the cards at the 147 uh, pound division. So if Katie wants to move up there, maybe at a catch weight and fight McCaskill again, that's a very marketable fight. You just have to watch the first one to know how competitive it was. And uh, that would be a brilliant fight. Natasha Jonas, who you would have seen on the Sky Punditry team, was uh, not shy in maybe putting it out there that she'd be open to a fight. And she's had a bit of a renaissance herself. She boxed very well in her world title fight against Terry Harper recently. Chantel Cameron is a mandatory challenger, but I think Katie is 
almost beyond the whole thing of mandatory challengers. She's proved that she can win all the belts. I think she's more about maybe trying to make more history. And there's a few other ones, as you mentioned. Amanda Serrano is obviously the one I think everybody wants, given she's a prolific champion in her own right. And that's been talked about ever since Katie turned pro, really. And then, of course, Holly Holm. Uh, again, how marketable would that be if you got the cross-promotion of Matchroom and the UFC? Chris Cyborg, who's with Bellator now, also on the DAZN platform, which Eddie Ahern has ties to. Again, great cross-promotion uh, potential there. And less likely, probably, is Amanda Nunes, who's probably the best female fighter in the UFC at the moment, who said she wouldn't mind doing a little bit of boxing at some point. So there's plenty of options for Katie Taylor. I think she's going to be around for a few years, yeah. Yeah, this is going to be a really interesting little while. Just on, on McCaskill, how much better is she than their first fight? Obviously, you're mentioning that the fact that that first fight in York Hall was actually a cracker. It was a really tight fight. I don't think a lot of people would have actually seen that, but she's obviously made strides forward since then as well, McCaskill. Yeah, she's just got this... Um, Katie made an interesting point about Pursun where it's because she, she doesn't really do anything technically correct that it's almost so difficult to time her because boxers coming through the amateur ranks have uh, this reflexive memory where if, a, if an opponent does something, they know what to do in return. Whereas Pursun is so unorthodox that that was a difficult read, read for Katie. And as was McCaskill at that point in her career, because I said Katie wasn't long out of the amateur game and McCaskill came with this sort of rather, I don't want to call it ungainly, but it wasn't a uh, characteristic of maybe what you'd see at the top end of professional boxing but she's since kind of honed her craft a little bit but what she did last week was against another elite technician in breakers she just kind of really put it on her set an incredibly high tempo and that's what she'd be looking to do again she will be the bigger uh, woman in the ring when she fights katie taylor and that will be a distinct advantage but again i thought katie looked uh, stronger on her feet uh, last Saturday night compared to maybe 14 months ago and that will have been owed in part to her fight in November when she moved up and fought Christina Linodato who's a, another handful but a very aggressive um, like sizable opponent to navigate for Taylor and I thought she did well in November and probably put that to good use again uh, at the weekend. Rona Mullen, great stuff, thanks a million. Thanks lads.